Welcome to episode 26 of The Putting Couch, brought to you by the Seymour Putter Company's tour team. I'm Jim Grunberg, along with Ted Galena and Cody Hale, and today we have the great honor of being uh, joined by our first SPI instructor that we've had on The Putting Couch, George Connor, and maybe one of the most decorated. George Connor is the three-time Connecticut PGA Section Teacher of the Year. He's been with Seymour for a long, long time. And George, we are delighted to have you on the putting couch today. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm, uh, it's a great honor to be here, and uh, I've always enjoyed working with you guys, and uh, so I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun today. Absolutely. And George is the uh, director of golf at Connor Golf uh, Academy, which is at the Farmington Woods um, Golf Club in Avon, Connecticut. Is that correct, George? Did I put that, you that? That is, no, that is correct. <laughs> Avon, Connecticut, Farmington <laughs> Woods, yep. And George great- is also... Go ahead. Uh, I just said Farmington was just a great uh, gated community, 1,100 condo units, uh, fun golf course to play, and a really cool membership. I teach a lot of people who are not members, but it's a great place to come to work every day. Fantastic. Well, those who've been listening to the putting couch and the the list is growing know that uh, at the Seymour Putter Company, we've been very, very blessed to have just a growing legion of worldwide instructors, teachers, fitters that believe in the Seymour putter, because it's not just a great putter, but it's also a great training aid. And um, George, you've been one of the guys that initially um, reached out to Seymour. And, you know, really one of our, one of our guys that you've been there all along, um, your credentials are, are incredible, and we can get into that. But tell me how, before we get into, you know, kind of your background and what you want to focus on, but tell me how, how did you come to Seymour and why have you stuck with the Seymour putter as sort of your core teaching um, product and, and, and so important in your, in your teaching? Well, back in, uh, geez, it's got to be 2000, maybe 11, 10 or 11 is when, um, when you all rolled out the SPI program. And uh, to me, it was a perfect fit. I teach, I don't teach as much putting as I'd like, but I, I can confidently say I teach more putting in, in my region than anybody else. Uh, so to have a, a putter company that had an offering for everybody, but also had, um, i call it technology and the RST and, and all that, it, it really was a perfect fit. Um, uh, Ted, Ted, who's on the call today, was a, uh, you know, kind of headed that program up and I got to know Ted really well. Um, Certainly no reason to stop the relationship. The putters just, to me, just keep getting better and better with different offerings. And like I said, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's a it's a company that, that builds a putter that is actually helping the student, um, helps the student do what I'm trying to get them to do. So when they leave me, they have stuff that's on, you know, there's dots and lines that are on the putter that, that without me there saying you're doing it right or doing it wrong or them videotaping, uh, there's some really simple checks to know that their setup is proper uh, that at the top of the backswing, that they have the amount, right amount of arc, the right amount of rotation. They can see the same thing at the finish. Um, it, to me, it's just a home run. And, you know, despite the technology, you know, in, in addition to the technology, um, the three of you folks to, to get a chance to, to work with you guys is uh, it's a lot of fun. You guys are great, great customer service and have become good friends of mine. So I, I, you got me for life. We, we appreciate that, George. And I know as, as in reviewing kind of the drill your way to great putting, it's a lot more than just drills, but it's really all encompassing on putting. And it's a very, very thoroughly researched um, book that you put out. I've got the 2018 edition, and we'll talk a little bit about how our, our listeners can get a hold of that because it is a fantastic book. And you talk, you start with your sort of your philosophy about what encompasses great putting. And then you really cover all facets. I mean, in turn, from, from the stroke to the, to the equipment, to drills. And um, so obviously, as you said, you haven't uh, maybe taught as much as you'd love to, but you still, um, you found a way to, as you said in the book, it's 40% of the game. So you've figured out a way to convey that to your students of all levels that, hey, this is something worth putting some time into. So tell us a little bit about your putting philosophy. Uh, so the philosophy that they described in the book is, um, is really, I, there's so much bad information out there in, in, in any aspect of the game. You know, if you if you walk, hanging around on a range on a Saturday morning, you know, Larry's telling Joe he's coming over the top. And 
Bob's telling Jim he's standing up and everything else. And they're, they're not saying anything that's going to help anybody, but they're, they're saying what they see. And, and for me, it's business, business generation. Cause if, if the guys listen to his accountant about how to play better golf, eventually he's going to have to come see me anyway. So I'm okay with that. But when it comes to putting to me, there's just, there's so much uh, myth out there that that's whether it's, um, you know, I've got to take the putter straight back and straight through and, um, you know, what, what's going to move the putter and things like that. So for me, it's, it all starts with a, a really consistent setup, uh, which includes aim and, and your body, your alignment of your body lines to that target line. The movement of the putter to me is always uh, should be bigger muscles as opposed to smaller. If you look back to, uh, you know, older, you know, black and white videos where green speeds were fives and fours and things like that, you'd see a lot of wrist hinge and everything else. Um, to me, that there's just it just makes the game way it makes the, the the skill of putting way too hard to do it that way. So I, I kind of think of shoulder shoulder blades and rib cage rotations to move the putter. Uh, one of the biggest things, and Cody and I were talking about this just before we went on the call, uh, is, and, and this is probably the worst advice that you know Larry gives Bob is, you know, you got to make sure you accelerate that putter. You know, don't don't decelerate, don't decelerate. So what I end up seeing, and this is probably the most common fault that I fix in, in the, the first putting lesson that I have with somebody is I see a putter that goes back, you know, just not nearly close to far enough into the backswing. And then the guy's just jamming the putter forward because he's, he's got to make sure he doesn't decelerate. And, and so the thing over accelerates and it just causes all kinds of problems. And the way I describe it, if I'm, if I'm giving a, a group putting clinic, and say I've got eight or ten people in front of me, and I'll say, and I always word it the same way. I say, who here thinks that they decelerate the putter? And invariably, uh, of eight, three or four are going to raise their hands. And I'll say, remember how I said that? I said, if you think you decelerate the putter, because if you're decelerating the putter, you know, your partners know, and frankly, the guy at the 150 marker can see that you're decelerating the putter up on the putting green. It, it's, I don't think people really understand what, 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 that phrase means when they're decelerating the putter. But then when we look at the better putters, the, the best putters, the, the backswing is always a little bit longer than the forward swing. Maybe it gets to 50, 50, but I always look at, you know, Ben Crenshaw, Tiger Woods, uh, Zach Johnson, uh, Jack Nicholas. These, these guys are, they're not great putters. They're not streaky putters. They're great every day. You know, they, they never really have an off day putting. Whereas the guy who's got the short, backswing and a long follow through he can get streaky he can get it going for for 18 holes or for nine holes or for three holes but then poof it's gone because there's just it's such an intangible thing to try to understand exactly how much acceleration you're going to put into the putter as opposed to letting the rhythm of the stroke and the length of the backswing determine how much energy is going to go into the ball and then when there's a collision with the ball the putter is going to decelerate so it makes perfect sense to me. And when I explain it to a golfer, it makes sense that the, the follow through is going to be a little shorter than the backswing because there is a collision there. Um, so that that's a big piece of of my putting philosophy. And and the other thing, and 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 I have to credit a lot of this to Pat O'Brien, who's a friend of, of all of us, is the putting grip, uh, getting out of that, you know, put it in the lifeline of your hands so that the shaft and the forearm are in a straight line and everything. To me, um, to me, it, it really mobilizes the wrist, whereas if you get it more in a conventional golf club position where it's more in the fingers and that heel pad at the base of your top hand, assuming a conventional grip, uh, um, is, is kind of hooked around the corner of the grip, uh, to me, that really does a good job of stable, stabilizing that left wrist. And so now that, you know, chasing the, the going down that road of, of trying all these different grips and pencil grips and, and overlaps and and Bernhard Langer styles and things like that. We can avoid a lot of that, a lot of that by just holding the putter a little bit differently, a little bit more the way you should be holding a five iron. If we still have five irons, most people have hybrids now. <laughs> George talking about, uh, you know, talking about your book and it being called drill your way to great putting. Uh, and, and you seeing that as a, you know, as a, you know, a common issue with players taking a short backstroke and having a longer follow through leading to speed control issues and start line issues. What are some of the drills that you recommend for your players to help improve that and get the proper feedback so that they know they're making a change or doing it correctly? Uh, that's a great question. Thanks, Cody. Uh, 
a couple different, I'll just kind of give like two scenarios. One is uh, teaching golf in Connecticut and, and uh, you know, there's, there's a, a chunk of time where we have to be indoors. And, and this to me is a great time for somebody who's going to try to try to change that, that stroke ratio um, to set up indoors and basically just take, I'll have them take two shoe boxes and an alignment rod and build a little bridge just outside their front foot. And just in their living room, if they have a putting mat or something, uh, start working on and actually feeling that putter, you know, just kind of putting the brakes on the putter shortly after impact so that if that shoebox alignment rod bridge, we'll call it, is just outside of my left foot as a right-handed golfer, if that putter is just wandering into the finish, it's going to go ahead and hit, and hit the alignment rod. I got to set it up again. Uh, and indoors, I don't know anybody indoors is hitting 40 or 50 foot putt. But if you're going to hit anything from five to even 20 feet in, indoors, which I think would still be a little bit on the long side, there really is no reason for that putter to go much past the outside of your front foot um, and, 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 and kind of get across the point that we're not we're not trying to push the ball down the target line, that there's actually a strike, that we're actually striking the golf ball. Um, one of the other things that I'll, I'll reference uh, way back when I think Ted and Jim are old enough to remember this. Cody might not be old enough to remember, but. In the back of Golf Digest, they used to have actually paper pages. They weren't magazine-style glossy pages. And it was, I don't know, breaking 100, breaking 90, breaking 80, whatever it was. And it's just a great image. It was a pencil sketch of a golf ball with an old-style thumbtack, just with a tip just started into it. And the concept of, you're not again, you're not pushing the ball down the target line. If there's actually a collision and you feel like you're actually going to you know, hit that thumbtack hard enough to drive it into the ball, um, and, and when we set that up indoors with a little bridge, so they get some feedback, uh, to me, that's a great one indoors outdoors. It's, um, I think a lot of anybody who's worked on their, on their putting skill has done some form of a ladder drill, ladder drill being that you're going to hit a bunch of putts from one place, but you've got either strings or tees or markers out there at, um, let's say 10, 20 and 30 feet. But what I like to do is, uh, actually have have a setup of how long is the backswing going to be for each of those distances and then what they can do now is is kind of retrofit what's the rhythm for for my stroke or what's the rhythm most importantly when you're getting ready to play that if i take the putter back let's say 10 inches in the backswing at what rhythm do i want that putter moving or what rhythm do i want the stroke to be that that ball goes 10 feet and then if i add just four more inches with the same rhythm and you can test the rhythm, whether it's a SAM or a, a GC quad or blast or any of that kind of stuff. So you can see the rhythm stays the same. If I add four inches to the backswing, I add 10 feet to the putt. So, so I've got, you know, say a, a, a T or a string on the ground, 10 inches behind the ball, 14 inches behind the ball, 18 inches behind the ball, and, and kind of figure out, okay, what rhythm, if I stay consistent with the rhythm, as I add those four inches, I can hit 10, 20, and 30 feet. And then in addition to that, or expounding on that a little bit, would be then to take the longer backswing. So instead of just 10 inches for the 10-foot putt, I might have them go to 14 inches, but really slow the rhythm down and just get the ball to go 10 feet, which it would then be if I have a downhill putt. If I've got 10 feet down the hill, um, you know, I, I want to be able to feel that, that slower rhythm and so now it's, you know, you, you're starting to incorporate a little bit of rhythm and then the length of the stroke. But what you're what I'm trying to take out of that is the golfers uh, adjusting in the forward swing, which, again, is just going to be there's so many tiny, tiny variables to that, that they're just not going to get good speed control. And to, uh, so to me, that, that kind of enhanced ladder drill is, is a great one that we should, I think we should all be doing outside whenever we can. Just find the flattest part on the green that you, that you can find, set up a little station like that. And then when you go out to play golf, you, you want to kind of take, take that reference. So you've got like, say, maybe three, three or six baseline putts. If you've done the slower tempo, you've got six and say, okay, now I've got, I've got 15 feet downhill. Well, that might be really close to what what that 10 foot putt was at a, maybe a slower tempo in the flat surface. And so there's a little bit of of interpretation. But to me, it gets somebody in tune with with 
managing just the two variables, the two variables being the length of the backswing and the rhythm of the stroke, as opposed to that really inconsistent variable of how much acceleration am I going to provide or how little am I going to provide. Um, and so I've, for years, I've been working on, on speed control using that method. Um, I hate the word method, but I just said it, so we have to leave it there, I guess. Uh, what, what also cleans up very quickly with that is all the little variations of the face at impact. I think it, it's very easy when you're, you're going to kind of slam that putter forward that you know, some, some golfers will, you know, their, their habit might be to get that putter face a little bit open. Others might get a little bit closed. The worst putters will do a little bit of both. Uh, and then lastly, is just is being able to hit the ball in the sweet spot. You know, I think gol- golfers understand the value of sweet spot contact, but they kind of forget about it on the putting green. You know, and all of a sudden that 30 footer late in the round comes up six feet short and they think they had, you know, some kind of a breakdown mentally or something. Well, no, I mean, if you hit it thin or something, it's just not going to go that far. Um, so sm- smoothing out the stroke, keeping the rhythm and, and, the, and the, the length of the backswing as the only two variables, I think, cleans up a, a, just a, a bevy of problems in putting. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I, you know how it is. I mean, you're telling me I've got to go put time into this. I mean, I mean, yeah. it's crazy. You know, it's and and this is something that, and I'm sure you can attest to it that that players of all levels can adapt to this pretty quickly, right? I mean, it is completely reverse in their you know, what they've known or what they've heard or what they've read, right? You got to accelerate through the pot is sort of completely reverse in that mentality, but it's something that they can implement pretty quickly and see the results. I mean, you know, being able to, like you said, strike it in the sweet spot is going to improve your distance control. But I mean, my gosh, if your timing gets better and you start hitting more putts online, Hey, you may make a few more. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And the, I, I don't know, it doesn't have to be the last point on this, but one of the kind of humorous things that I hear a lot is, you know, the guy's just awful. You know, he's, he, you know, I got 42 putts and this, that, and the other thing. And, and I say, you know, well, here, here's, here's what your swing, your stroke looks like and all this wandering into the follow through is hurting you and everything. And let's take it back a little further and stop it right after impact. And he's like, man, that's like a pop stroke. That's like, that's like Brant Snedeker. And I'll say, you know, you know who Brant Snedeker is, but Brant Snedeker doesn't know who you are. So maybe, maybe he's doing a little <laughs> differently and, Maybe you might want to adopt, uh, you know, that that kind of look or that kind of feel. And then, like like anything else, in anything in golf, if you if the golfer feels it extremely different, and they'll use the word weird or this feels awful or strange or anything else, I like to replace those words with new and different things like that. But you put it on film, and they look at themselves and like, oh, oh, wow, that looks pretty good. You know, that that looks like the guys on TV or something. So, you know, a little bit of a little bit of technology goes a long way just to show them that as strange as it feels that, that things are, are actually going in the right direction. It's interesting that you mentioned Snedeker because everybody talks about how different his stroke is. But the one thing about his stroke that's the same as the guys that you talked about, the Tiger Woods, Jack Nicklaus, Zach Johnson, is, is that that 55 to 45 or that 60, 40 or 52 to 48 ratio where the backswing is longer. So with Brant. It looks like he's got a little bit more energy, and it looks like when he hits it, it almost looks like the putter face recoils. But if you watch those other guys, I mean, they're doing exactly what you're teaching, which is using the distance that they bring it back. So, you know, a lot of times that's that it's a pendulum, right? But a lot of people, to your point, there's these words out there that are misunderstood, that are myths. And so most golfers are, are starting with a fundamental flaw in how they think a putt should be hit. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when you watch a bunch of guys on the putting green, you can see, as you said, sort of that wandering putter kind of trying to chase it down. When you watch a great putter putt on TV from a distance at a tour event, it's always about that slow, steady, predictable rhythm where Mm -hmm. they're using that relationship. And, And it's almost like they're pulling it back to a set amount and just gravity plus a slight guiding is bringing it down to the ball. And once it hits the ball, it's done its job. I mean, that, that the angle is square, the ball is headed off, and anything that happens after that is really just drama effect. Yeah, I think it, it's, definitely, it's, it's definitely drama as far as the ball is concerned, but I think it, it creates a, a lot of confusion mm-hmm. with, the gol- with the golfer. And, and to me, and you know, the, the way I'll, I'll kind of, yeah, if I get that, that student that's just, eh, he just doesn't want to buy into that, I'll say, okay. And the putting green in my facility is enormous. It's probably 130 feet from end to end. 
And I said, okay, I'm going to give you two chances to hit a putt from here to there. One, you can only take it back to here, but you can follow through as much as you want. And then the other one, you're going to take it back as far as you want, but you can only follow through to this point here. And they'll, they'll hit them, and lo and behold, wow, I can put a lot of energy into that putt if I, boom, put the brakes on it. And that's the one thing I, I will explain. You know, and I, I agree with Cody. It's a, it's a very kind of quick transition or very short learning curve. But what happens very early on in, in, that, in that discussion is those 10 to 15 foot putts will, will they'll go three to four feet by at the very beginning because the guy just doesn't understand how much more energy is, is going into the ball. And now, you know, a 40 foot uphill putt, which is almost impossible for some players to get enough energy with that old stroke. Um, yeah, it's really no big deal to, to go ahead and give it a little, little bit of pop, certainly a strike at impact. And now, you know, the ball is, is tracking better and, and goes the right distance. George, you're you're a very accomplished uh, teaching instructor, PGA professional there in your section. Um, we, you know, you're on Golf Channel Academy. We see you on TV. We see on the local news giving uh, tips and and short lessons. And one of the uh, areas where you're very accomplished is on Aimpoint Express or Aimpoint. And I know that's a big thing when you watch golf, when it comes back on again, you hear every now and then, you know, they're holding up the fingers or one of the commentators talking about aim, aim point. Tell us, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about what that is, what you've done and how, uh, you know, it, you enable that in with your putting lessons. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ted. Uh, yeah, I started with Aimpoint back in 2010, right about the time that I, I started in with you guys. And at, at the time, uh, Mark Sweeney was the is the inventor of Aimpoint, and it was it was a very very accurate science based, fact based system of reading greens. It was also very complicated, very complex, uh, and we would we would teach Aimpoint classes or people to read greens via Aimpoint, and take out all the all the we were talking about myths earlier. All the myths about you know why putts break is um, it's actually funny. You know the balls break towards buildings and towns and bodies of water and things like that. <laughs> um, what is it? So the ball breaks towards water, right? And then the ball breaks towards the setting sun. So I always wondered, like in in West Palm Beach, Florida, you know the greens, you know are they schizophrenic, you know because the the water's to one side, <laughs> and the setting suns to the other. Um, but really, and Mark's the genesis of this was Mark looked at it and said, you know, this is the most definable portion of golf. You know, it was, it was a stage where we were using radar system to, to fit irons and and drivers and, and we're out there with lasers and GPS and everything else. I always like the guy that's got GPS and a laser, uh, it's kind of like suspenders (laughs) and a belt, but so they're trying to figure out, okay, is it, you know, is it, is it 154 to the flag or is it 152 or whatever else? And, and, and but there's, there's so many other variables to that. There, there's, there's, you know, is, the ball, is it uphill to the green? Is it downhill? Is, is the wind coming one way or the other? Is it a little bit colder? I mean, certainly up here in Connecticut right now, it's still cold enough that we have to, you know, take that extra half a club. And so all those variables go into it. But you, you take a golf ball that's rolling across the surface. If you can define the surface that's rolling across, meaning, in what direction is the slope going? How severe is that slope? Um, how long is the ball going to be rolling is basically what you need to know. So Mark built a computer system, and, and it, it, he could push, punch in the variables, and, and he could, he could tell that, okay, a putt's going to break a certain amount of inches. And so we had a, a chart that wasn't specific to any green. It wasn't a topographical map or anything. Basically, it looked like a dartboard, and then you'd figure out, okay, um, uh, 15 feet from the hole, it's a 2% grade, and the putt's going 60 de- at a 60 degree angle to the to the to the straight putt, and say, okay, that putt's going to break 10 inches if it's uh, given a certain green speed. It it works fantastic, and I still use the chart just because I learned it um, very on early on. I I taught hundreds and hundreds of players to use it. I, I got used to it. The problem with it is is a lot of people they they couldn't quite they wouldn't quite put the time in. Uh, to be able to use the chart on the on the golf course effectively and and efficiently so quickly enough, and then Aimpoint Express came out, which was such a benefit in a lot of different ways. Uh, one one of which is extremely easy to use, ex- extremely easy to learn. Uh, it was actually started. Um, it it kind of generated out of uh, 
Rob Noel is a teacher down in, in uh, I think it's Metairie, Louisiana, near New Orleans, and teaches a lot of kids. And, you know, I had engineers that couldn't figure out how to use the chart. And he'd have a five-year-old kid that had no concept of, of, you know, break on a green. And if you watch a little kid, you know, a little – I love seeing the kids out on the putting green. But, man, they have no idea the ball's going to curve. They're just going to hit it straight to the hole. So all, what, all he had him do is he said, okay, go, just stand there. And if you feel the slope going one way or another, he said, hold up a thumb and, you know, close an eye and put, you know, this part of your thumb here. and See, see that spot over on the other side of the thumb? Just hit it over in that direction. And so all he was trying to do was get a kid to figure out that I've got to hit it somewhere over there because the ball is going to curve towards the hole. But from that uh, is, is what is Aimpoint Express today, which we, when we get back on television, you'll see, you know, countless players using it. There's hundreds of players all over the world on all different tours, and they're putting up fingers to, to, to kind of see where they're going to start it. Um, it really simplified it, uh, which is great. So I think it, going to Express was such a boost for Aimpoint. A, people actually use the entire system now, uh, and they can use it. I mean, I, I tell them, look, I'll give you, I'll give you the basics of an Aimpoint Express for an hour, and you can go on the golf course, and you might miss a couple reads, but you're going to use the system correctly. And then the other thing that I really like about it is when we were using the charts, you'd see a tour player looking in the yardage book, and you, know, you don't know if he's looking at a topographical map or, or anything else. But when they start putting fingers up, we, we know there's, there's one system that they're using, and that's Aimpoint. And it's also extremely legal. You know, there's restrictions now on how much, how detailed these these green maps can be and everything else like that. We don't need any of that stuff. So the players are not using the, they're really discarding the the green book when they're using the Aimpoint Express. The the two are independent. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you're if you're using Aimpoint Express, you don't need the green book. That's cool. Well, yeah. So you're really covering all facets, and then I know you're also a big believer. You know, like like all great instructors in training aids and, um, you know, probably not too many, but you mentioned sometimes even the homemade ones are the best. So uh, training aids are still you, you did mention, I think, in the book that you know, for the average golfer, you're, you're not even suggesting that they go out there and grind with their practice and putting. I think you said 30 minutes is about the maximum. I don't know. Is that something that you're still sort of sticking with in terms of that that 30 minute window is is where you can get your work done? Uh, yeah, 30 minutes. I, I might even back that down to 20 minutes. Now, I'm not saying that we're only going to practice our putting for 20 minutes. If, if we're if we're looking to be, uh, you know, an elite player, a competitive player, or something like that, we're going to need more than 20 minutes a day. Uh, but I wouldn't want more than 20 minutes in a stretch. So if you wanted to putt for 20 minutes and then go work on your bunker game for 20 minutes and then work on maybe some distance wedges and then come back to putting for 20 more minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, I think, is about the max that you're, you're really engaged and interested. And in that, if, if we said it's 30 minutes, I might, I might have a player work with five or six drills in that 30 minutes just to keep them engaged at certain times. And then there's other times, and again, this goes more to competitive players where they might do a drill for uh, one drill for 15 minutes, but it might be a, a drill that's very, very hard uh, you know, to complete. You know, saying they've got to make X number of putts or they've got to score a certain thing in a certain number of points in a, in a system um, th that would be a little bit different, but if you're working on mechanics of the stroke or a, a specific skill, if I'm just working on starting the ball online, then I, I would want to have three or four drills at least and spend six or seven minutes with each of those cycle through. So the, the, the arousal level, the engagement level stays pretty high and we don't get kind of bored. And, and next thing you know, we're just kind of going through the motions where, if we're practicing our putting, we're not really even getting steps in. We're not burning any calories, but we're not getting any better. So um, I think we, we want to keep moving on, uh, you know, from, from, say, station to station or drill to drill. George, that's awesome information. What, uh, for, for our listeners and everybody, you know, are you doing online lessons? And if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, how would they? Yeah, I, uh, I just recently released an app. It's um, if you go to the iTunes store or at Google Play. You just type in George Connor or Connor Golf, and it'll come up. And on the app, you can do a, um, you know, kind of, a, I guess I can call it a traditional online lesson. I don't know if traditional and online are, <laughs> is, is, is online old enough to be called traditional? But what I mean by that is, is a, a student in anywhere uh, could film maybe a couple of strokes, uh, maybe a face-on view, so we could look at ratio of strokes, 
and then a down the line view where the, the hole or the target is in view. Um, and now I can look at posture and, and, and the shape of the stroke and things like that. So the, the app gives you the option of, of sending in those two strokes, typing, you know, I don't know, up to maybe 500 words or something about what they're, what's happening with their putting performance and what they're looking to get out of it. Uh, from there, I can, I can draw lines, I can do voiceovers, I can type back to them messages and also attach um, some drills. I got a bunch of drills in, the, in this library and, and I'll, I'll maybe type. I'll say, here, here's the three drills I want you to work on and I can attach those to the lesson. So it's, it's kind of a neat way to, to do some, some distance learning. Um, since we're, that's a, that's a big word now, right? Distance learning, that, that's a new word. Um, so we can, we can do that. And then I will, I will do, uh, you know, Skype calls, Zoom calls, FaceTime calls, that's, that sort of thing. Um, the only thing that, that I kind of will, will ask before we do that is that the student be in a setting where he can actually hit putts. You know, I've had a couple of those where the guy's like, yeah, I don't have a putter or anything like that. So we just, you know, there's not a lot of value to that. But if he, he could do that from his putting green or, or, or if she has a putting mat in the house or something like that, so we can hit some putts and, and, and talk about it that way. To me, the, the, the online lesson where you're going through the app makes a, a, just a whole bunch of sense for the putting stroke, though. Well, and the great thing is it also, it means that people from around the world will have access to you, George, versus just the, you know, the people in the, in the Avon, Connecticut area. So I hope some people yeah. take you up on that because uh, you've got a wealth of information and it's a lot, the game's a lot more fun when, uh, when putting all of a sudden clicks in. And uh, it, I know, <laughs> I'm sure your it, students are, are, are giving you that feedback. Uh, it sure is. Yeah. I mean, any, any, any time we can get somebody excited about putting, I think that just in itself um, goes a long way towards, towards increased performance, whether that's, you know, understanding aim point and in an aim point class, you know, we're going to, we're going to kind of explain how it all fits together that there's, there's a, there's a read that occurs, but the, if, if the read is that the ball is going to start on a, on a trajectory that's 10 inches outside the hole, then there's a speed that fits that. And then there's the ability to start the ball online. And those are the big three. So we explain that. And again, there, there's an excitement about putting. Um, I've been uh, fortunate to fit a lot of Seymour putters over the years. I mean, there's nothing more exciting than having a new wand, a new putter to go out. And you, it actually makes you want to practice a little bit, lo and behold. Um, so anything we can do, I think, to, to bring the excitement to putting uh, as opposed to the I think a, a lot of people is just kind of the drudgery. Well, now I got to I got to do this three or four more times to, to hit the driver on the next hole. Um, if we can get excited about putting and understand how important it is. Fantastic. Well, hey, we hope we can have you on again, George, because uh, this has been just absolutely uh, a blessing to us. We, we love having you part of the team. And um, it's, uh, it's been a great, great uh, time of sharing here. You've been listening to The Putting Couch, brought to you by the Seymour Putter Company's tour team. I'm Jim, along with Cody and Ted. We've had George Connor. Look up George Connor, Connor Golf. Go to that app. Um, seek him out because he's got a wealth of knowledge, and uh, he can help make the game more fun, and he can help uh, bring your scores down and, and uh, actually bring 40% of the game putting into that area that you're looking forward to doing. So, George, thanks very much. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. We appreciate you joining us. If you haven't subscribed to the show, make sure you do wherever you're listening. Be sure to leave a rating and review because that's how we get the Putting Couch podcast content in front of more people. Also, take a screenshot and share it on social media and tag us at Seymour Putters or hashtag Team Seymour.